All right, everyone, so today's video is a little bit different and I know I'm gonna get a massive backlash for the title of this video and some of you might even unsubscribe. But can I please ask you to give me just 11 minutes to explain why I feel the way I do for the She-Hulk TV series. I promise you this is not a right-wing channel with an agenda to bring a show down. I've been in love with Marvel Comics since I was a kid and now that I have close to 2 million subscribers, I consider it my duty to be honest to my audience and explain why She-Hulk is just a complete and utter trash of a show. I'm gonna give you 5 points throughout this video and hopefully by the end you will realize I'm not here trying to spread hate towards Marvel but I genuinely want them to improve in the future because I love them so much. And please don't label this video as a part of toxic fandom because I feel toxic fandom means hating a certain show or a movie for no good reason. So by the end of this video if you feel what I'm saying doesn't make sense then feel free to give me a dislike. But please don't without hearing me out first. So let's get on with the video. Number 1 telling a significant tragedy through a few lines of dialogue. And here's what I mean by this. Here's the thing, Bruce. I'm great at controlling my anger. Mm. I do it all the time. When I'm catcalled in the street, when incompetent men explain my own area of expertise to me. So I'm an expert at controlling my anger because I do it infinitely more than you. When Jennifer Walter said this, it triggered a lot of people. And I can see exactly why. Because you're telling us that she suffered, that she was catcalled, but you're not showing us. I know it's a comedy show, but at least dedicate an episode where you show the audience how much she suffered in society just because she's a woman. Show us how becoming a lawyer was twice as difficult for her as opposed to a man becoming a lawyer. And let me tell you how big of a mess this entire scene is. By the time this scene comes in episode 1, this is actually happening in a flashback sequence. In present time, Jen has already become She-Hulk. And this is just her taking us back and telling us how she became She-Hulk. So we are in a flashback sequence where Jen is telling us about her past life experiences. So we are getting a flashback within a flashback. And that too through dialogues. If you are gonna take us back, take us back a few years ago. That way we can visually see how cruel the world is to Jennifer just because she's a woman. I've seen people who are against LGBT Q writes, watched the movie The Imitation Game, and they literally had their view changed when they walked out of the cinema. That's the power of storytelling when done correctly. So don't just tell us Jennifer suffered, show us how she suffered. Show us how everyone tried to bring her down but she still kept going. Let me give you another example of visually showing a scene instead of telling us through a few lines of dialogues. Forget Hulk rage. Just regular anger means death and destruction for everything and everyone around you. And I'm telling you, when people start seeing you as a monster, that never goes away. This scene resonates with the audience because we've been seeing Bruce since 2008. We've seen visually how the world treated him like a monster, while all he ever wanted was peace. Now imagine Hulk saying this without us getting his 13 years of character development. Then this scene wouldn't resonate with anyone. It would be just a few lines of dialogue. And don't just show a few silly scenes in the family diner where nobody cares about our emotions. Families are mostly like that. That's not a bad thing. And don't just write a lazy generic male character who's a misogynist, who if you remove from the show will make no impact whatsoever. For example, take a look at what Marvel did with Steve Rogers. They showed us how every step of the way, Steve was neglected, bullied, and underestimated just because of his size. And those people were partially correct too. Steve was really not able to do a lot of the things because of his smaller physique and his lack of strength. But once he took on the serum, tolerated the incredible pain in the process, he won those people over. He didn't tell us to accept him when he was smaller. Instead, he got bigger and the world accepted him automatically. So give us something like this when you're writing a female character. Character. Don't write her off as a perfect human being right off the bat. Show us her flaws and how she was bullied because of those flaws. And then make her go through a huge arc where she comes out a winner at the end. Basically what I'm trying to say is, if you are writing a show that's about four and a half hours long, at least dedicate an hour showing us how she suffered in her life. So she won't even need to say dialogues like this, the audience just will know it. Number 2. Very Rush Writing now that we've established that Jen genuinely believes she's better at controlling her emotions than Bruce because she's suffered more as she says, but this same Jennifer then ends up saying this to Bruce Banner. My life wasn't taken away. Really? Oh, so you didn't wind up alone? Hiding away on some remote beach with no friends, no relationships, never seeing your family, and definitely not dealing with a decade's worth of trauma? 
Why would you want that for me, Bruce? That's the price you have to pay for keeping the world safe. Now, yes, she does apologize for disrespecting Bruce like this, but just after three minutes. And I'm sorry that I said a bunch of harsh but very true things. Wow, an apology that still doubles down on a thing you're apologizing for. That's very lawyerly. Now, as Bruce pointed out, this is not a sincere apology, and it was meant to be that way. So that's not my issue. My issue is how quickly it happened. Let this apology come later, perhaps in the final episode, where she realizes Bruce was right. Saving the universe does come with a heavy price, and that's why not everybody can save the universe. But because it was so rushed, this apology sequence literally had no impact. Her bursting out at Bruce was well written, but the scene to bring a closure to it wasn't. And this is just one example of rush writing out of many. I know they were limited to only 30 minutes per episode, and they only had 6 episodes to do it with, but still, that's more than what a movie gets nowadays. So I don't think we can blame rush and lazy writing to the duration of the content. Let's take Deadpool 2 for example. That movie movie is 95% comedy, but it still had consequences throughout. The love of his life was killed, he had to make a lot of tough decisions, and that still didn't take away anything from this film's comedy. So we can't blame rush writing on comedy either. Number 3. Isolating your own audience Now what does that mean exactly? Let me explain. When Iron Man 1 came out, the movie that literally saved and started the MCU, that has a male protagonist who's a billionaire playboy who sells weapons of mass destruction, was liked by both male and female audience. It wasn't a film just made for men. It was made keeping the general audience in mind, not just one spectrum. Yes, I agree, Iron Man 1 was predominantly enjoyed by men, but it wasn't only catering to men. When Tony kept sleeping around with different women every night, it wasn't portrayed as a noble thing. In fact, this scene showed us how lonely and depressed Tony is. It was necessary to show how he objectifies women in order to make a full circle at the end, where he ends up marrying Pepper Potts and gives her his everything. But when it comes to She-Hulk, Jennifer Walters is a character written only for a certain group of female audience, not even for a female audience in general. I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but I'm saying when you have the budget as Marvel does, have such a rich graphic novel to get inspired from, why limit yourself by only catering to one group of audience? If your fan base is mostly men, and you want to reach out to a female audience, write a female character that gets loved by everyone on board, regardless of their preference. That's what you're trying to achieve, right? You're trying to diversify your audience by building a female fan base. So if that's the case, why not trust your existing male audience to help you out? Why isolate them for one show and say, this one is not made for you, you sit this one out? Are you not doing the exact same thing that you oppose? Imagine you make a show and say, it's only made for men, women should sit this one out. And it's been happening in Hollywood since the beginning, and that's sexist and we want to fix it, right? But the solution to that is not treating men badly. The solution to that is treating women equally. If your existing fan base doesn't like a show you're producing, how are you supposed to gain a new audience? It's like you're abandoning your first child because there's a second one on the way. Don't do that! You've got to take care of them both at the same time. You don't have to please one set of audience at the expense of the other. Number 4. Contradictory Character Traits Now one thing that makes a great protagonist is character values. But the character of Jennifer Walters and She-Hulk come across as a confused and contradictory so many times that the audience just doesn't get a chance to know the real her. For example, she tells us many times that she doesn't want to be a Hulk. She doesn't care, she just wants a regular lawyer life. But at the same time, she complains when her Hulk persona is given the name She-Hulk. That's for somebody called She-Hulk, which can't possibly be what they're calling me. That name better not stick. It's so dumb. I can't even exist without being a derivative of the Hulk. So either she cares about her Hulk persona or she doesn't. It can be both. Then we see her accepting a job from Mr. Hallway who got her fired in the first place. And he even tells her he's gonna make her the head of a new division. To be head of a new division, yes. But when she comes to know she got the job for being a Hulk, she takes issue with it. Now why wouldn't a smart lawyer like her be able to work it out that her getting hired in a superhuman law division must have something to do with her Hulk persona? It's like Tony coming to hire young Peter Parker, and Peter is wondering if Tony's here for one of his school projects. It's like Black Widow complaining, oh you're only making me an Avenger because I'm better at hand to end combat than most people. My point is, either she is written as a very stupid lawyer, or she just didn't bother doing any research before joining GLK and H. And for some who says she has been through it all should be able to deduce what's coming her way and why. If she cannot deduce, then she hasn't been through it all. And if she can, she would have seen it miles ahead why she is getting hired. So she apologizes like a lawyer, but isn't very lawyerly when accepting a job. And that's what I mean by contradictory character traits. You ask what Black Widow stands for, you'll get an answer from the audience. You ask what Steve Rogers stands for, you'll also get an answer from the audience. But the writers never clearly depicted She-Hulk stance on any important matter, whether she will make a sacrifice for the greater cause or 
or be selfish and accept what comes her way regardless. Bottom line is, She-Hulk had zero character development throughout the show. Number 5. Hiring writers who quite blatantly admitted they can't write courtroom scenes. Now before I dive deeper into this point, remember Christopher Nolan's Interstellar where he did so much research before making the film that his version of a black hole and a real black hole, which we came to see 5 years after the movie's release, look very, very similar. And this accurate detail gives this movie that unique rewatchability factor. But that's a visual detail. More credits go to the VFX team than Nolan. But the story that he wrote was so in line with real life physics that this movie has now become an all-time favorite for science nerds and even for the general audience. Why? Because he did his research. He chose a subject to make a movie on that he knew he can do justice to. But the show She-Hulk, that has attorney at law literally in the title, their writers come forward and say, we realized very early on that we were not that great at writing courtroom scenes. So why hire them in the first place? Marvel is known for giving new writers opportunities and complete freedom over their craft. But if that's still the case, how did we end up with this crap? And can I just say how bad the villains were in the show? But first let me tell you what a good villain looks like. It's someone who will kill you no matter what, but doesn't want to. A villain like Thanos. A villain like He Who Remains. They don't want to kill, but they have to, because they believe they're doing it for a greater good. Now I know we can't bring a villain of that stature into a Disney Plus show, but that doesn't mean you will write your villains like they're a bunch of 9 year olds. And it's really upsetting for me that Dan Slott, a comic book writer who I love and admire, would defend She-Hulk like this while questioning a film like Iron Man. He's saying this without realizing that Tony having strippers in his private jet was still a part of his overall character arc, how he turned from being a womanizer to a one-woman man. Plus, I don't think the majority of Marvel fans have any issues with accepting a dominating female lead, because most fans loved WandaVision, including myself, and Elizabeth Olsen literally carried that show. Vision was literally a creation of hers, and even the villain was a female. So please don't tell me Marvel fans don't like female-centric content, because we do. And it's also not correct to assume that we love every Marvel movie that has a male lead, because most fans were equally hers towards Thor Love and Thunder, which had an OG Avenger aka Chris Hemsworth. So it's not about who you have in the lead or the genre. It's about whether the story is compelling enough to move the audience. And now for people who might come up to me and say, if you know so much better, then why don't you write your own Marvel show? Well, I can't. I trust Kevin Feige and I know with proper feedback from the audience, with rational criticism, Marvel will get back on track. And how do you define a movie's success if not for the word of mouth from the audience? Why is it that studios take credit when the audience loves something? But when they don't, it's always the audience's fault. And let me end this video with this one thing. Don't just write strong female characters. Write strong characters that are female. See you lads in the next one.